Hello. To celebrate Halloween and the lead up to it, I'm going to read you a short story by Robert Bloch, more famous for, of course, writing the, the story on which the film Psycho Norman Bates was based. This short story is called The Skull of the Marquis de Sade, and I've got it from this book, Christopher Lee's Omnibus of Evil. Christopher Lee does write a short introduction to the story, but as I can't manage to do a Christopher Lee imitation, can't quite get the deep enough voice, I'll skip that and go straight to the story. Christopher Maitland sat back in his chair before the fireplace and fondled the binding of an old book. His thin face, modelled by the flickering firelight, bore a characteristic expression of scholarly preoccupation. Maitland's intellectual curiosity was focused on the volume in his hands. Briefly, he was wondering if the human skin binding this book came from a man, a woman, or a child. He had been assured by the bookseller that this tome was bound in a portion of the skin of a woman. But Maitland, much as he desired to believe this, was by nature sceptical. Booksellers who deal in such curiosa are not overly reputable. As a rule, and Christopher Maitland's years of dealing with such people had done much to destroy his faith in their veracity. Still, he hoped the story was true. It was nice to have a book bound in a woman's skin. It was nice to have a crook sansata fashioned from a thigh bone, a collection of diac heads, a shriveled hand of glory stolen from a graveyard in Maitz. Maitland owned all these items and many more, for he was a collector of the unusual. Maitland held the book up to the light and sought to distinguish poor formation beneath the tan surface of the binding. Women had finer paws than men, didn't they? Beg pardon, sir. Maitland turned as Hume entered. What is it? he asked. That person is here again. Person? Mr. Marco. Oh. Maitland rose, ignoring the butler's almost grotesque expression of distaste. He suppressed a chuckle. Poor Hume didn't like Marco or any of the raffish gentry who supplied Maitland with items for his collection. Hume didn't care for the collection itself either. Maitland vividly remembered the old servant's squeamish trembling as he dusted off the case containing the mummy of the priest of Horus, decapitated for sorcery. A Marco, eh? Wonder what's up? Maitland mused. Well... Better show him in. Hume turned and left with a noticeable lack of enthusiasm. As for Maitland, his eagerness mounted. He ran his hand along the reticulated back of a jadeite Tao Te and licked his lips with very much the same expression as adorned the face of the Chinese image of gluttony. Old Marco was here. That meant something pretty special in the way of acquisitions. Perhaps Marco wasn't exactly the kind of chap one invited to the club, but he had his uses. Where he laid his hands on some of the things he offered for sale, Maitland didn't know. He didn't much care. That was Marco's affair. The rarity of his offerings was what interested Christopher Maitland. If one wanted a book bound in human skin, Old Marco was just the chap to get hold of it, if he had to do a bit of flaying and binding himself. Great character, old Marco. Mr. Marco, sir. Hume withdrew a sedate shadow, and Maitland waved his visitor forward. Mr. Marco oozed into the room. The little man was fat. Greasily so, his flesh lumped like the tallow coagulating about the guttering stump of a candle. His waxen pallor accentuated the simile. All that seemed needed was a wick 
to sprout from the bald ball of fat that served as Mr. Marco's head. The fat man stared up at Maitman's lean face with what was meant to be an ingratiating smile. The smile oozed too and contributed to the aura of uncleanliness which seemed to surround Marco. But Maitland was not conscious of these matters. His attention was focused on the curious bundle Marco carried under one arm, the large package wrapped in prosaic butcher's paper which somehow contributed to its fascination before him. Marco shifted the package gingerly as he removed his shoddy grey ulster. He did not ask for permission to divest himself of the coat, nor did he wait for an invitation to be seated. The fat little man merely made himself comfortable in one of the chairs before the fire, reached for Maitland's open cigar case, helped himself to a stogie and lit it. The large round package bobbed up and down on his lap as his rotund stomach heaved convulsively. Maitland stared at the package. Marco stared at Maitland. Maitland broke first. Well, he asked. The greasy smile expanded. Marco inhaled rapidly and opened his mouth to emit a puff of smoke and a reply. I am so sorry to come unannounced, Mr. Maitland. I hope I am not intruding. Never mind that, Maitland snapped. What's in the package, Marco? Marco's smile expanded. Something choice, he whispered. Something tasty. Maitland bent over the chair, he said, out thrust to throw a vulpine shadow on the wall. What's in the package? he repeated. You're my favourite client, Mr. Maitland. You know I never come to you unless I have something really rare. Well, I have that, sir. I have that. You'd be surprised what this butcher's paper hides. Although it's <laughs> rather appropriate, yes. Appropriate it is. <laughs> Stop that infernal gabbling man. What's in the package? Marco lifted the bundle from his lap. He turned it over, gingerly yet deliberately. Doesn't seem to be much, he purred. Round, heavy enough. Might be a medicine ball, eh? Or a beehive. I say it could even be a, a head of cabbage. <laughs> Yes, one might mistake it for a head of common cabbage, but it isn't. Oh, no, it isn't. <laughs> Intriguing problem, eh? If it was the little man's intention to go to Maitland into a fit of apoplexy, he almost succeeded. Open it up, damn you, he shouted. Marco shrugged, smiled, and scrabbled at the taped edges of the paper. Christopher Maitland was no longer the perfect gentleman, the perfect host. He was a collector, stripped of all pretenses. Quivering eagerness incarnate, he hovered over Marco's shoulder as the butcher's paper came away in the fat man's pudgy fingers. Now, Maitland breathed. The paper fell to the floor. Resting in Marco's lap was a large, glittering, silver ball of tinfoil. Marco began to strip the tinfoil away, unravelling it in silvery strands. Maitland gasped as he saw what emerged from the wrappings. It was a human skull. Maitland saw the horrid hemisphere gleaming ivory white in firelight. Then, as Marco shifted it, he saw the empty eye sockets and the gaping nasal aperture that would never know human breath. Maitland noted the even structure of the teeth, adherent to a well-formed jaw. 
Despite his instinctive repulsion, he was surprisingly observant. It appeared to him that the skull was unusually small and delicate, remarkably well preserved despite a yellow tinge hinting of age. But Christopher Maitland was most impressed by one undeniable peculiarity. The skull was different indeed. The skull did not grin. Through some peculiar formation or malformation of cheekbone in juxtaposition of jaws, the death's head did not simulate a smile. The classic mockery of mirth attributed to all skulls was absent here. The skull had a sober, serious look about it. Maitland blinked and uttered a self-conscious cough. What was he doing entertaining these idiotic fancies about a skull? It was ordinary enough. It was old Marco's game in bringing him such a silly object with so much solemn preamble. Yes, what was Marco's game? The fat little man held the skull up before the firelight, turning it from time to time with an impressive display of pride. His smirk of self-satisfaction contrasted oddly with the sobriety set indelibly upon the skull's bony visage. Maitland's puzzlement found expression at last. What are you so smug about? he demanded. You bring me the skull of a, a woman or an adolescent youth. Marco's chuckle cut across his remark. <laughs> exactly what the phrenologist said. <laughs> he wheezed. Damn the phrenologist's man. Tell me about this skull if there's anything to tell. Marco ignored him. He turned the skull over in his fat hands with a gloating expression which repelled Maitland. It may be small, but it is a beauty, isn't it? The little man mused. So delicately formed, and look, there's almost the illusion of a patina upon the surface. Uh, I'm not a paleontologist, Maitland snapped. Not a grave robber either. You'd think we were Burke and Hare. Be reasonable, Marco. Why should I want an, an ordinary skull? Please, Mr. Maitland, what do you take me for? Eh? Do you think I would presume to insult your intelligence by bringing you an ordinary skull? Do you imagine I would ask a thousand pounds for the skull of a nobody? Eh? Maitland stepped back. A thousand pounds? he shouted. A thousand pounds for, for that? And cheap at the price, Marco assured him. You're paid gladly when you know the story. I, I, I wouldn't pay such a price for the skull of Napoleon, Maitland assured him. Or, or Shakespeare, for that matter. You'll find that the honour of this skull tickles your fancy a little bit more, Marco assured him. Enough of this, let's have it, man. Marco faced him, one pudgy forefinger tapping the osseous brow of the death's head. You see before you, he murmured. The skull of the Mercian Alphonse Francois, the Marquis de Sade. <laughs> Gilles Doré was a monster. Torquemada's inquisitors exercised the diabolic ingenuity of the fiends they professed to exercise. But it remained for the Marquis de Sade to epitomise the living lust for pain. His name symbolises cruelty incarnate, the savagery men call sadism. Maitland knew de Sade's weird history and mentally reviewed it. The Count, or Marquis de Sade, was born in 1740 of distinguished Provençal lineage. He was a handsome youth when he joined his cavalry regiment in the Seven Years' War. A pale, delicate, blue-eyed man whose fish diffidence cloaked an evil perversity. At the age of 23, he was imprisoned for a year as the result of a barbaric crime. Indeed, 
<coughs> 27 years of his subsequent life he spent in incarceration for his deeds. Deeds which, even today, are only hinted at. His flagellations, his administration of outre drugs, and his tortures of women have served to make his name infamous. But de Sade was no common libertine with a primitive urge towards the infliction of suffering. He was, rather, the philosopher of pain, a keen scholar, a man of exquisite tastes and breeding. He was wonderfully well read, a disciplined thinker, a remarkable psychologist and a sadist. How the mighty Marquis would have squirmed had he envisioned the petty perversions which today bear his name. The tormenting of animals by ignorant peasants, the beating of children by hysteric attendants in institutions, the infliction of senseless cruelties by maniacs upon others, or by others upon maniacs. All these matters are classified as sadistic today. And yet none of them are manifestations of de Sade's unnatural philosophy. De Sade's concept of cruelty had in it nothing of concealment or deceit. He practised his beliefs openly and wrote explicitly of such matters during his years in prison, for he was the apostle of pain, and his gospel was made known to all men in Justine, Juliette, Aline et Valcourt, the curious La Philosophie dans la Boudoir, and the utterly abominable Les 120 Journées. And de Sade practised what he preached. He was a lover of many women, a jealous lover, willing to share the embraces of his mistresses with but one rival. That rival was death. And it is said that all women who knew de Sade's caresses came to prefer those of his rival in the end. Perhaps the tortures of the French Revolution were indirectly inspired by the philosophy of the Marquis, a philosophy that gained circulation throughout France following the publication of his notorious tomes. When the guillotine arose in the public squares of the cities, de Sade emerged from his long series of imprisonments and walked abroad among men, maddened at the sight of blood and suffering. He was a grey, gentle little ghost, short, bald, mild-mannered and soft-spoken. He raised his voice only to save his aristocratic relatives from the knife. His public life was exemplary during these latter years, but men still whispered of his private life. His interest in sorcery was rumoured. It was said that to de Sade, the shedding of blood was a sacrifice, and sacrifices made to certain beings bear black boons. The screams of pain-maddened women are as prayer to the creatures of the pit. The Marquis was cunning. Years of confinement for his offences against society had made him wary. He moved quite cautiously and took full advantage of the troubled times to conduct quiet and unostentatious burial services whenever he terminated an amour. Caution did not suffice in the end. An ill-chosen diatribe directed against Napoleon served as an excuse for the authorities. There were no civil charges, no farcical trial was perpetrated. De Sade was simply shut up in Charenton as a common lunatic. The men who knew his crimes were too shocked to publicise them. And yet there was a satanic grandeur about the Marquis which somehow precluded destroying him outright. One does not think of assassinating Satan, but Satan chained. Satan chained, languished. A sick, half-blind old man who tore the petals from roses in a last gesture of demoniac destructiveness, the Marquis spending his declining days forgotten by all men, they preferred to forget. Preferred to think of him mad. In 1814 he died. His books were banned, his memories desecrated, his deeds denied, but his name lived on, lives on as an eternal symbol of innate evil. Such was de Sade, as Christopher Maitland knew him, and as a collector of curiosa, 
The thought of possessing the veritable skull of the fabulous Marquis intrigued him. He glanced up from reverie, glanced at the unsmiling skull and the grinning Marco. Uh, a thousand pounds, you said? Exactly, Marco nodded. A most reasonable price under the circumstances. Under what circumstances, Maitland objected? You bring me a skull, but what, what proof can you furnish me as to its authenticity? How did you come by this rather unusual memento mori? Come, come, Mr. Maitland, please. You know me better than to question my sources of supply. That is what I choose to call a trade secret. <laughs> yeah. Very well. But I can't just take your word, Marco. To the best of my recollection, Dassard was buried when he died at Charenton in 1814. Marco's oozing grin expanded. Well, I can set you right about that point, he conceded. Do you happen to have a copy of Ellis's studies about? In the section entitled Love and Pain, there is an item which may interest you. Maitland secured the volume, and Marco rifled through the pages. Here, he exclaimed triumphantly, according to Ellis, the skull of the Marquis de Sade was exhumed and examined by a phrenologist. Phrenology was a popular pseudoscience in those days, eh? Chap wanted to see if the cranial formation indicated that the Marquis was truly insane. It says he found the skull to be small and well-formed like a woman's. Exactly your remark, as you may recall. But the real point is this. The skull wasn't reinterred. It fell into the hands of Dr. Lunder, but around 1850 it was stolen by another physician who took it to England. That is all Alice knows of the matter. The rest I could tell. <laughs> But it's better no to speak. Here is the skull of the Marquis de Sade, Mr. Maitland. Will you meet my offer? A thousand pounds, Maitland sighed. It's, it, it, it's too much for a shoddy skull in a flimsy story. Well, let us say... Eight hundred, perhaps. A quick deal and no hard feelings. Maitland stared at Marco. Marco stared at Maitland. The skull stared at them both. Five hundred, then, Marco ventured. Right now? You must be faking, Maitland said. Otherwise you wouldn't be so anxious for a sale. Marco's smile oozed off again. On the contrary, sir, if I were trying to do you, I certainly wouldn't budge on my price, but I want to dispose of this skull quickly. Why? For the first time during the interview, fat little Marco hesitated. He twisted the skull between his hands and set it down on the table. It seemed to Maitland as if he avoided looking at it as he answered. I don't know exactly. It's just that I don't fancy owning such an item, really. It works on my imagination. <laughs> Rot, isn't it? Works on your imagination? I, I get ideas. I am being followed. 
Of course, it's all nonsense, but um, you get ideas, you're followed by the police. No doubt, Maitland accused. Because you stole the skull, didn't you, Marco? Marco averted his gaze. No, he mumbled. It, is, it isn't that, I, but I don't like skulls. They're not my idea of ornaments, I assure you. Squeamish I am, a bit. Uh, besides, you live in this big house here. <coughs> besides, you live in this big house here. You're safe. I live in whopping now, down on my luck at the moment, and all that. I sell you the skull. You tuck it away here in your collection. Look at it when you please. And the rest of the time it's out of sight. No bothering you. It'll be free of it. Uh, I'll be free of it knocking round my humble diggings. Matter of fact, when I sell it, I'll vacate the premises and move to decent lodgings. Eh? That's why I really want to be rid of it. No, really? For five hundred cash in hand? Maitland hesitated. I, I, I must think it over, he declared. Give me your address. Should I decide to purchase it, I'll be down tomorrow with the money. Fair enough. Very well. Marco sighed. He produced a greasy stub of pencil and tore a bit of paper from the discarded wrappings on the floor. Here is the address, he said. Maitland pocketed the slip as Marco commenced to enclose the skull in tin foil once more. He worked quickly as though eager to obscure the shining teeth and the yawning emptiness of the eye sockets. He twisted the butcher's paper over the tin foil, grasped his overcoat in one hand and balanced the round bundle in the other. I'll be expecting you tomorrow. Uh, and by the way, be careful when you open the door. I have a police a dog now, a savage brute. Uh, he'll tear you to pieces. Not anyone else. Who tries to take the skull of the Marquis de Sade? Hmm? It seemed to Maitland that they had bound him too tightly. He knew that the masked men were about to whip him, but he could not understand why they had fastened his wrists with chains of steel. Only when they held the metal scourges over the fire did he comprehend the reason. Only when they raised the white-hot rods high above their heads did he realise why they held him so securely. For at the fiery kiss of the lash, Maitland did not flinch. He convulsed. His body, seared by the hideous blow, described an arc. Bound by thongs, his hands would tear themselves free under the stimulus of the unbearable torment. But the steel chains held and Maitland gritted his teeth as the two black-robed men flogged him with living fire. The outlines of the dungeon blurred, and Maitland's pain blurred too. He sank down into a darkness broken only by the consciousness of rhythm, the rhythm of the savage, sizzling steel flails that descended upon his naked back. When awareness returned, Maitland knew that the flogging was over. The silent black-robed men in masks were bending over him, unfastening the shackles. They lifted him tenderly and led him gently across the dungeon floor to the great steel casket. Casket? This was no casket. Caskets do not stand open and upended. Caskets do not bear upon their lids the raised, moulded features of a woman's face. Caskets are not spiked inside. Recognition was simultaneous with horror. This was the Iron Maiden. The masked men were strong. They dragged him forward, thrust him into the depths of the great metal matrix of torment. They fastened wrists and ankles with clamps. Maitland knew what was coming. They would close the lid upon him. Then, by turning a crank, they would move the lid down. Move it down as spikes drove it in at his body. For the interior of the Iron Maiden was studded with cruel barbs, sharpened and lengthened with the cunning of the damned. 
The longest spikes would pierce him first as the lid descended. These spikes were set so as to enter his wrists and ankles. He would hang there crucified as the lid continued its inexorable descent. Shorter spikes would next enter his thighs, shoulders and arms. Then, as he struggled impaled in agony, the lid would press closer until the smallest spikes came close enough to penetrate his eyes, his throat and, mercifully, his heart and brain. Maitland screamed, but the sound served only to shatter his eardrums as they closed the lid. The rusty metal grated, and then came the harsher grating of the machinery. They were turning the crank, bringing the banks of spikes closer to his cringing body. Maitland waited, tensed in the dark, for the first sharp kiss of the Iron Maiden. Then, and only then, he realised that he was not alone in the blackness. There were no spikes set in the lid. Instead, a figure was pressed against the opposite iron surface. As the lid descended, it merely brought the figure closer to Maitland's body. The figure did not move or even breathe. It rested against the lid. As the lid came forward, Maitland felt the pressure of cold alien flesh against his own. The arms and legs met his in unresponsive embrace, but still the lid pressed down, squeezing the lifeless form closer and closer. It was dark, but now Maitland could see the face that loomed scarcely an inch from his eyes. The face was white, phosphorescent. The face was not a face. And then, as the body gripped his body in blackness, as the head touched his head, as Maitland's lips pressed against the place where lips should be, he knew the ultimate horror. The face was not a face, but was the skull of the Marquis de Sade and the weight of charnel corruption stifled Maitland, and he went down into the darkness again with the obscene memory pursuing him to oblivion. Even oblivion has an end, and once more Maitland woke. The masked men had released and were reviving him. He lay on a pallet and glanced towards the open doors of the Iron Maiden. He was oddly grateful to see that the interior was empty. No figure rested against the inside of the lid. Perhaps there had been no figure. The torture played strange tricks on a man's mind, but it was needed now. He could tell that the solicitude of the masked ones was not assumed. They had subjected him to this ordeal for strange reasons, and he had come through unscathed. They anointed his back, lifted him to his feet, led him from the dungeon in the great corridor beyond Maitland saw a mirror. They guided him up to it. Had the torture changed him? For a moment, Maitland feared to gaze into the glass. But they held him before the mirror, and Maitland stared at his reflection, stared at the quivering body on which was set the grim, unsmiling, death's head of the Marquis de Sade. Maitland told no one of his dream. But he lost no time in discussing Marco's visit and offer. His confidant was an old friend and fellow collector, Sir Fitzhugh Kisroy. Seated in Sir Fitzhugh's comfortable study the following afternoon, he quickly unburdened himself of all pertinent details. Genial, red-bearded, Kisroy heard him out in silence. Naturally, I want that skull, Maitland concluded. But uh, I can't understand why Marco is so anxious to dispose of it at once. And I'm considerably worried about its authenticity. So I was wondering, you're quite an expert, Fitzhugh. Would you be willing to visit Marco with me and examine the skull? Sir Fitzhugh chuckled and shook his head. There's no need to examine it, he declared. I'm, I'm quite sure the skull, as you describe it, is that of the Marquis de Sade. It's, it's genuine enough. Maitland gaped at him. How can you be so positive? he asked. Sir Fitzhugh beamed. Because, my dear fellow, that skull was stolen from me. What? Quite so. About ten days ago, a prowler got into the library through the French windows facing the garden. None of the servants were aroused, and he made off with the skull in the night. Maitland rose. Incredible he murmured. 
But of course you'll, you'll come with me now, we'll identify your property, confront old Marco with the facts, and re recover the skull at once. Nothing of the sort, Sir Fitzhugh replied. I, I'm just as glad the skull was stolen, and I advise you to leave it alone. I didn't report the theft to the police, and I have no intention of doing so, because that skull is... Hmm, unlucky. Unlucky? Maitland peered at his hosts. You, with your collection of cursed Egyptian mummies, tell me that? You've never taken any stock in such superstitious rubbish? Exactly. Therefore, when I, when I tell you that I, I sincerely believe that skull is dangerous, you must have faith in my words. Maitland pondered. He wondered if Sir Fitzhugh had experienced the same dreams that tormented his own sleep upon seeing the skull. Was there an associative aura about the relic? If so, it only added to the peculiar fascination exerted by the unsmiling skull of the Marquis de, the Marquis de Sade. <coughs> I don't understand you at all, he declared. I should think you couldn't wait to lay hands on that skull. Perhaps I'm not the only one who can't wait, Sir Hugh muttered. What are you getting at? You know Desard's history. You know the power of morbid fascination such evil geniuses exert upon the imagination of men. You feel that fascination yourself. That's why you want the skull. But you're a normal man, Maitland. You want to buy the skull and keep it in your collection of curiosa. An abnormal man might not think of buying her. He might think of stealing it, or, or even killing the owner to possess it. Particularly if he wanted to do more than merely own it. Eh? If, for example, he wanted to worship it. Sir Fitzhugh's voice sank to a whisper as he continued. I am not trying to frighten you, my dear friend, but I know the history of that skull. During the last hundred years, it has passed through the hands of, of many men. Some of them were collectors and, and, and sane. Others were perverted members of, of secret cults, worshippers of pain, devotees of black magic. Men have died to gain that grisly relic, and other men have been oh, sacrificed to it. It came to me... Quite by chance, six months ago, a man like your friend Marco offered it to me, not for a thousand pounds or five hundred pounds. He gave it to me as a gift, because he was afraid of it. Of course, I, I laughed at his notions, just as you are probably laughing at mine now. But during the six months that the skull has remained in my hands, I've suffered. I've had queer dreams. Just staring at the unnatural, unsmiling grimace is enough to provoke nightmares. Didn't you sense an emanation from that thing? They said Desard wasn't mad, and I believe them. He was far worse. He was possessed. There's something mm, un unhuman about that skull, something that attracts others. Living men whose skulls hide a bestial quality that is also unhuman or, or, or inhuman. And I've had more than my dreams to deal with. Phone calls came and mysterious letters. Some of the servants have reported lurkers at the grounds on a dusk. Probably ordinary thieves like Marco after the valuable object, Maitland commented. No! Sir Hugh sighed. Those unknown seekers did more than attempt to steal the skull. They came into my house at night and adored it. Uh, I am quite positive about the matter, I assure you. I kept the skull in a glass case in the library. Often when I came in to see it in the mornings, I found that it had been moved in the night. Yes, moved. Sometimes the case was smashed in the skull placed on the table. Once it was on the floor. Of course, I checked up on the servants. Their alibis were perfect. It was the work of outsiders. 
outsiders who probably feared to possess the skull completely, yet needed access to it from time to time in order to practice some abominable and perverted rite. They came into my house, I tell you, and worshipped that filthy skull. And when it was stolen, I, I, I was glad, very glad. All I can say to you is keep away from the whole business. Don't see this man, Marco, and don't have anything to do with that accursed graveyard relic. Maitland nodded. Very well, he said. I am grateful to you for your warning. He left Sir Fitzhugh shortly thereafter. Half an hour later, he was climbing the stairs to Marco's dingy attic room. He climbed the stairs to Marco's room, climbed the creaking steps in the shabby Soho tenement, and listened to the curiously muffled thumping of his own heartbeat. But not for long. A sudden howl resounded from the landing above, and Maitland scrambled up the last few stairs in, in frantic haste. The door of Marco's room was locked, but the sounds had issued from within stirred Maitland to desperate measures. Sir Fitzhugh's warnings had prompted him to carry his service revolver on this errand. Now he drew it and shattered the lock with a shot. Maitland flung the door back against the wall as the howling reached the ultimate frenzied crescendo. He started into the room, then checked himself. Something hurtled towards him from the floor beyond. Something launched itself at his throat. Maitland raised the revolver blindly and fired. For a moment, sound and vision blurred. Then, when he recovered, he was half kneeling on the floor before the threshold. A great shaggy form rested at his feet. Maitland recognised the car carcass of a gigantic police dog. Suddenly he remembered Marco's reference to the beast. So that explained it. The dog had howled and attacked. But why? Maitland rose and entered the sordid bedroom. Smoke still curled upwards from the shots. He gazed again at the prone animal, noting the gleaming yellow fangs grimacing even in death. And then he stared around at the shoddy furniture, the disordered bureau, the rumpled bed. The rumpled bed on which Mr. Marco lay, his throat torn in a red rosary of death. Maitland stared at the body of the little fat man and shuddered. Then he saw the skull. It rested on the pillow near Marco's head, a grisly bedfellow that seemed to peer curiously at the corpse in ghastly camaraderie. Blood had spattered the hollow cheekbones, but even beneath this sanguinary stain, Maitland could see the peculiar solemnity of the death's head. For the first time, he sensed the aura of evil which clung to the skull of Dessard. It was palpable in this ravaged room, palpable as the presence of death itself. The skull seemed to glow with actual charnel phosphorescence. Maitland knew now that his friend had spoken the truth. There was a dreadful magnetism inherent in this bony horror, a veritable elixir of death that worked and preyed upon the minds of men and beasts. It must have been that way. The dog, maddened by the urge to kill, had finally attacked Marco as he slept and destroyed him. Then it had sought to attack Maitland when he entered, and through it all the skull watched, watched and gloated just as Dessard would gloat had his pale blue eyes flickered in the shadowed sockets. <coughs> Somewhere within the cranium, perhaps, the shriveled remnants of his cruel brain were still attuned to terror. The magnetic force it focused had a compelling enchantment even in the face of what Maitland knew. That is why Maitland, driven by a compulsion he could not wholly explain or seek to justify, stooped down and lifted the skull. He held it for a long moment in the classic pose of Hamlet. Then he left the room, forever, carrying the death's head in his arms. Fear rode Maitland's shoulders as he hurried through the twilight streets. Fear whispered strangely in his ear, warning him to hurry, lest the body of Marco be discovered and the police pursue him. Fear prompted him to enter his own house by a side door and go directly to his rooms, so that none would see the skull he concealed beneath his coat. Fear was Maitland's companion all that evening. He sat there, staring at the skull on the table and shivered with repulsion. Sir Fitzhugh was right, he knew it. 
there was a damnable influence issuing from the skull and the black brain within. It had caused Maitland to disregard the sensible warnings of his friend. It had caused Maitland to steal the skull itself from a dead man. It had caused him now to conceal himself in this lonely room. He should call the authorities. He knew that. Better still, he should dispose of the skull, give it away, throw it away, rid the earth of it forever. There was something puzzling about the cursed thing. Something he didn't quite understand. For, knowing these truths, he still desired to possess the skull of the Marquis de Sade. There was an evil enchantment about here, the dormant baseness in every man's soul that aroused and responded to the loathsome lust which poured from the death's head in waves. He stared at the skull, shivered, yet he knew he would not give it up, could not, nor had he the strength to destroy it. Perhaps possession would lead him to madness in the end. The skull would incite others to unspeakable excesses. Maitland pondered and brooded, seeking a resolution in the impassive object that confronted him with the stolidity of death. It grew late. Maitland drank wine and paced the floor. He was weary. Perhaps in the morning he could think matters through and reach a logical, sane conclusion. Yes, he was upset. Sir Fitzhugh's outlandish hints had disturbed him. The gruesome events of the late afternoon preyed on his nerves. No sense in giving way to foolish fancies about the skull of the mad Marquis. Better to rest. Maitland flung himself on the bed. He reached out for the switch and extinguished the light. The moon's rays slithered through the window and sought out the skull on the table, bathing it in eerie luminescence. Maitland stared once more at the jaws that should grin and did not. Then he closed his eyes and willed himself to sleep. In the morning he'd call Sir Fitzhugh, make a clean breast of things, and give the skull over to the authorities. Its evil career, real or imaginary, would come to an end. So be it. Maitland sank into slumber. Before he dozed off, he tried to focus his attention on something. Something puzzling. An impression he'd received upon gazing at the body of the police dog in Marco's room. The way its fangs gleamed. Yes, that was it. There had been no blood on the muzzle of the police dog. Strange, for the police dog had bitten Marco's throat. No blood? How could that be? Well, that problem was best left to morning too. It seemed to Maitland that as he slept he dreamed. In his dream he opened his eyes and blinked in the bright moonlight. He stared at the tabletop and saw the skull was no longer resting on its surface. That was curious too. No one had come into the room or he would have been aroused. <coughs> if he had not been sure that he was dreaming... Maitland would have started up in terror when he saw the stream of moonlight on the floor, the stream of moonlight through which the skull was rolling. It turned over and over again, its bony visage impassive as ever, and each revolution brought it closer to the bed. Maitland's sleeping ears could almost hear the thump as the skull landed on the bare floor at the foot of the bed. Then began the grotesque progress so typical of night fantasies. The skull climbed the side of the bed. Its teeth gripped the dangling corner of a bedsheet, and the death's head literally whirled the sheet out and up, swinging it in an arc which landed the skull on the bed at Maitland's feet. <coughs> the illusion was so vivid he could feel the thud of its impact against the mattress. Tactile sensations continued, and Maitland felt the skull rolling along up the covers. It came up to his waist, then approached his chest. Maitland saw the bony features in the moonlight, scarcely six inches away from his neck. He felt a cold weight resting on his throat. The skull was moving now. Then he realised the grip of utter nightmare and struggled to awake before the dream continued. A scream rose in his throat but never issued from it. For Maitland's throat was seized by champing teeth, teeth that bit into his neck with all the power of a moving human jawbone. The skull tore at Maitland's jugular in cruel haste. There was a gasp and a gurgle, and then no sound at all. 
After a time, the skull righted itself on Maitland's chest. Maitland's chest no longer heaved with breathing, and the skull rested there with a curious simulation of satisfied repose. The moonlight shone on the death's head to reveal one very curious circumstance. It was a trivial thing, yet somehow fitting under the circumstances. Reposing on the chest of the man it had killed, the skull of the Marquis de Sade was no longer impassive. Instead, its bony features bore a definite, unmistakably sadistic grin. Thank you.